My histories do not come on a plate. They do not come neatly packaged for me, split into easy to digest pieces. They do not come bandaged and glamorized and made beautiful for us tourists of the past to look upon. They go back into darkness, into ink, into spilt blood, into the darkness of minds and the true darkness of absolute obscurity, of names forgotten to time, of ink on walls, of journeys, of documents lost. I've been a lover of history for a long time. I loved taking it as a subject at school, much to my mother's dismay when she thought that history was a bunch of memorizing dates. I grabbed a copy of the complete works of Oscar Wilde during the holidays of year 10 and devoured each and every poem. I savored the taste of antiquity in my mouth, the strange words, glister, austere, inviolate, dissonance. I cursed the fact that our museums in this country have hardly any classical artifacts, but I still enjoyed the golden gilt colonial paintings, the Victorian gadgets, the rusting knickknacks in antique stores. I even tried dressing like a 50s woman. I curled my hair with foam rollers, slipped on Mary Jane's shoes, put on red lipstick every day. I sought out waistcoats, long skirts, anything that would give me a snatch of the past. The history that once seemed so distant to me, now I wanted it on my teeth. Yet, despite worshipping all of these things, I knew I couldn't have fit into any of those errors. I'm the wrong race to be any of, in any of the smiling advertisements. The wrong gender to go put on my waistcoat and go out expeditioning. My love would have been illegal. My brain probably would have gotten me locked away somewhere or banished to be a recluse forever. I don't get to say that I was born in the wrong generation. I wouldn't have had a safe existence in another generation. I tried turning to histories that were not mine to have. My poems morphed into pseudo-wild ramblings, lofty and flowery. They were, quite reasonably, rejected by the journals I sent them to. I didn't understand it at the time. I thought that people simply didn't appreciate the past, that I was misunderstood for my genius. If all those old poets could write like that and be loved, why couldn't I? I realized I needed to turn inwards, look at my own histories, I pored over the family books that once seemed so boring to me. One of my relatives made a website for our family lineage. You can always trust Chinese New Zealanders to keep track of everything. And I read over all of the names that led to me, here, a fourth generation Chinese New Zealander. The names were not proper and British in my mouth, but felt foreign, strange. My great-great-grandmother, Von Chu Lin. My great-great-grandfather, Chun Yi Hop. I learned that Von Chu Lin came here at 16, married off from her village and made to find a whole new life in such a faraway land. She had 18 children, never ceasing her work at her store on, her, on Jesse Street. Her stays in hospital after giving birth were the only breaks she ever had. I learned this was often the typical life for these Chinese New Zealanders. In this country full of Gold and glory and dog eats dog, newcomers were always seen as competition. It feels so distant to me now to think of my relatives as newcomers when this country is all I've ever known. But there always needs to be a first step. And with that first step into the unknown comes all of the hostility of being othered. Children were told that if they wandered onto Haining Street, where the infamous Chinatown was, they would be boiled and turned into pickled ginger. Newspapers contained horrid caricatures, warnings against the yellow peril, desperate outcries for the country to be kept pure. It's no wonder that so many of these Chinese New Zealanders kept their heads down, buried themselves in their work to try and ignore the raging outside of shop windows. When they learned that the land of milk and honey wasn't all that it seemed, they could at least cling to the hope that someday they might get the glittering success they dreamed of by working hard. Because of this othering, we know so little about these people who are just as important in New Zealand's history. When you belong to the dominant cultural group, 
All of the narratives are centered around you. You have the great canon of musicians, poets, artists. Your art is the fine art, and everything else is just fringe. Despite European and Chinese settlers having so many of the same ambitions, only the European man got to be romanticized. His story is that of the hopeful settler, a simple pastoral man with a dream, whereas the Chinese are filthy, immoral, only there to create competition for the true dreamers. You don't get to be the subject of your portrait, only part of the landscape. When I researched for history assignments, I found hundreds of photos of Chinese gold miners, their faces sun-hardened, their waistcoats smeared with dirt. Names unknown. I found records of men known only by the names of their shops, only remembered by the dry goods they sold, their names forever lost to anyone's tongues. When you're always on the periphery, you don't get the luxury of being remembered. You trade today's obscurity for tomorrow's hope. Some might wonder why I worry about all of this. It was in the past. So much time has passed between then and now, it's nothing but old stories, dust and relics. But the way we construct our stories and histories can have such an impact on people, and is so much more personal than you might think. In 2020, during my year 12 history exam, we were made to read a poem by Lionel Terry, an evil, murderous man who committed New Zealand's first recorded hate crime. He killed Chinese man Jo Kum Young on Haining Street in 1905 for no other reason but the fact that he was Chinese. He went down to Chinatown to kill a Chinaman, saw one, and took his chance. Even after he was arrested and taken to an asylum, his book full of white supremacist poems was praised with many people at the time of the opinion that he had done nothing wrong. His poems were saying what they were all thinking. Lionel Terry is a turning point for the Chinese New Zealand community. He's a reminder that these histories have been so unkind to us that a man could kill another man and the newspapers would praise him for it. Commemorations are still held. The event is still remembered all these years later, especially through works such as Chris Teese's How to Be Dead in the Year of Snakes. In the description of the author, NZQA simply said that he was a little-known white supremacist who was known for his views on race. Even now, the feelings of that white man are held up as more important than the Chinese man he killed. We were made to read his poem about conditions and asylums, I, knowing who Terry was, was expected to swallow down his sadness, to bow my head to him, to listen to his words all these years later. A poet, a charming man, tell us how he was mistreated. Put his guilty name in your mouth, while innocent names remain forever unknown. Sure, this is in the past. Over a hundred years have passed. Yet when NZQA first responded to me, they said they weren't extending sympathy to Terry, despite the fact that they focused on a murderer's sorrow instead of his crime, the cause of his woe instead of the aftermath of his hatred. The way histories are constructed time and time again favor the victor. They never favor the underdog the othered creatures, the ones that keep their heads down and don't open their mouths to even speak their foreign names. Fun Chu Lin and Chun Yi Hop, my great-great-grandparents, would have just arrived in New Zealand when Jo Kum Young was killed. They would have been just around the corner. They would have heard the gunshot. These histories are a part of me now. Jo Kum Young. That was probably the name of his shop. My relatives would have had his real name in their mouths. They experienced his first death, the one that left a blood stain on the Haining Street pavement. Now I, with his name lost to time, experience his second. It seems bleak that these histories are seemingly unchanging, that our National Qualifications Authority would focus on the murderer instead of the crime, but there is still so much hope for the future. 
We are history, right here, right now. Every single word I speak is becoming history as soon as it leaves my mouth. We can learn from history, this much is evident, but we can also shape it and speak out about the way it is portrayed in the history books. There's that old phrase that history is written by the victors, but I would say that's not entirely true. History is written by whoever has the pen, whoever records it. Historically, due to lack of access, lack of resources, language barriers, this has meant that the victors have always had control over the narratives. But now with so many different ways to tell stories, this doesn't always have to be the case. Especially with technology that allows so much information right at the tips of our fingers, there's no way for one person to control the narrative anymore. I'm a poet, and I think I always would have been, no matter how things turned out. I love words. I still love Oscar Wilde and poets I follow on Twitter and everything in between. But the best thing and the most vital thing about writing is that it is an act of preservation. A poem is a way to preserve a part of yourself, a part of a moment. I am not just telling histories. I am creating histories because I am telling them. As Richard Seiken says, history is painted by the victors. Keep your paints wet. Trust me, I have things to say. I know it's trite to condense anything into a single idea, but I think so much of what I do is creating histories for myself, categorizing feelings. I am a lover of history because I have so little of my own to tell, but so few people like me represented in our stories of the past. That's why I'm always so avid to create new narratives. I wrote my musical in blind faith during my last year of high school, and it'll be put on again this August at Bats Theatre. We made it our priority to cast Asian New Zealanders and include queer romance, despite it being such an archaic story. And it's beautiful to me. It really is. Seeing an Asian person finally get to be the hero instead of the underdog, in charge of their glory instead of meekly subservient to it. Finally, the subject of the portrait, instead of just part of the landscape. If we are told that we cannot have these stories, then we will find a way to insert ourselves into them, making sure that everyone knows we deserve to have a taste of the past too. If we write these things, they will be there, bold and bright to the eye, unable to be ignored. The reason I know so much of my family history is because Chun Yi Hop wrote it down in a little black book full of the names of all our relatives and ancestors. He carved out a place for himself by writing his story, and now I will try to do the same. If it weren't for him, those names would be forever lost to my tongue. Nothing but a little black book and some ink to trade for an eternity of remembrance, of existence, of saying, look, I was here. That's what I always want to be saying with every single word I write. I am here. I am here. You can't ignore me. Thank you.